Hadi Chang did her PhD uh, with Ron Kishani at Harvard Medical School. And she worked on bacteria, if I remember correctly. And then when she graduated, just when she was about to graduate, they met with her. And I remember we had a very long discussion and conversation in Harvard Yard. And after that, she went to the Broad Institute where she did her postdoctoral work with Aviv Regev. Uh, aiming to work on very, very challenging problems, which we discussed yesterday, but meanwhile, founding another meaningful problem in which she was able to make a dent, and she is going to, to tell us about. I look forward to your presentation. Um, so thank you, Nikolai, for the invitation and the organizers for making this happen. Um, so as Nikolai mentioned, I'm a postdoc with Avi Ragev and Bei Chen now at the Broad Institute. and. I'll talk to you about a single cell method to measure intranuclear protein levels and RNA in vivo. So our motivation was to measure cellular states and how they change, uh, which is very nice to go after John Yates's beautiful talk. Uh, so we were interested in how cells respond to environmental signals and how cellular activities remodel cell states. And cell states mean a variety of different things, um, such as how they respond to environmental stimuli or something as mundane as cell cycle not mundane, but something as recurrent as cell cycle. And many of these cell state changes are actually mediated by proteins that reside in the nucleus. From a transcriptional perspective, there are a lot of regulatory proteins, such as transcription factors, and even chromatin structures and spliceosomes that all shape what kind of gene expression profiles are presented by each cell. So we wanted to study these nuclear proteins. Uh, specifically, we wanted to study how these nuclear proteins are um, a key marker for cellular activity. So one canonical pathway we uh, um, know from cell signaling is that oftentimes an external sig signal that stimulates and activates a receptor uh, activates a signal transduction cascade, resulting in the downstream translocation of a transcription factor. In several dis disciplines, um, such as broadly speaking in um, neuronal uh, activation studies and immune cell activation studies, some of these key nuclear transcription factors are often used as an indicator for cell state changes. So you may have heard of TFs called CFOS or P65 in these studies. And furthermore, from a functional perspective, the concentration of these proteins in the nucleus is actually a very informative and mechanistic parameter that determines gene regulation. So the concentration of the proteins of transcription factors have an uh, important bearing on the search kinetics of how the protein searches along the genome for which genes to bind and regulate. And in light of all of this, it's important to note uh, that we all appreciate now that the RNA expression of the encoding genes of these transcription factors are actually poorly correlated to the protein levels and certainly do not reflect their localization within the cell. So uh, one, uh, one of the motivators for us was to actually understand and identify how transcription factors may differentially target genome-wide expression directly in tissues in vivo, especially in a cell type uh, specific manner. Um, here I'm showing on the left a cartoon showing PU.1, which is a key lineage specifying transcription factor, which is critical for determining the outcomes of microglia as well as macrophages circulating in our blood. And although these are two uh, uh, very different, uh, morph certainly morphologically, but also functionally different uh, cell types, they're still regulated by the same master regulator. So it's important to be able to study these in a cell type specific way using single cell technologies and as well as study them in vivo. And furthermore, from a clinical perspective, the nuclear transcription factor levels are often used as a heuristic to see uh, how disease progressions happen, especially in uh, diseases such as cancer and many others, which are often diseases of misregulation or dysregulation of gene expression. So we wanted to ask a very simple question, uh, which is to extract quantitative protein levels and relate them to gene expression in vivo using single cell technologies. So on the left here, I'm showing you a immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence image of the mouse hippocampus. Simply stains with just one transcription factor, CFOS, which indicates uh, neuronal activity. And we want to extract the heterogeneity in the protein levels in this uh, brain tissue and transform that into a quantitative uh, protein value. And coupled with RNA sequencing, we want to be able to 
relate and study the dynamics of gene expression to the expression levels of these proteins inside the nucleus where gene, exp uh, gene regulation occurs. And one technical advantage of using single nucleus approaches rather than single cell approaches is that it would enable greater access to profiling cell tissues, such as heart, kidney, and brain. Um, we saw a beautiful talk from Peter Smyber, who has really pioneered, yeah, pioneered a lot of these methods, but most of these um, whole cell extracts require nice dissociation, which is often challenging for solid tissues for clinical studies. And they're often limited to studying immune cells that do not require dissociation. So now uh, I'll give a quick overview, which uh, Peter Smyber has made my job really easy uh, for this context. So Peter gave a beautiful talk on how he really pioneered the development of methods to jointly measure protein levels and RNA in single cells using uh, currently available technologies, uh, specifically on the 10X platform. So SiteSeq uses DNA conjugator proteins that have a poly A tail so that you can have simultaneous capture of the protein tag abundance as well as the uh, poly A attached RNA molecules. And in the last couple of years, there's been an explosion of these uh, applications to protein targets below the cell surface. But all of these applications so far have been conducted looking at cyto mostly cytoplasmic targets and in uh, circulating immune cells. So here we wanted to look at intranuclear uh, applications of SiteSeq that would be able to measure proteins in the regulatory context of the nucleus and also uh, from a practical perspective, enable access to profiling cell tissues. So to graphically illustrate our uh, approach, we simply wanted to extract nuclei from a cell and cross-link and permeabilize the nuclear membrane in order for DNA conjugated proteins to be able to penetrate the nuclear membrane and attach their transcription factor targets with high specificity. And there's been a few key uh, technical developments. Um, so in principle, this is rather simple, but as Peter alluded to earlier, this is actually quite challenging technically, as the nucleus is a site of high non-specific binding by DNA conjugated antibodies. And so we um, developed a, an approach to do this, which I'll describe. And our um, preprint is available on BioArchive and is also forthcoming in a, couple, in a month or two. So we first uh, developed Insight Seek to measure transcription factor translocation in the reporter cell line. We used a HeLa cell line engineered to have a fluorescent tag called M neon green, it's a green fluorescent protein, tagged to a transcription factor called P65. P65 uh, actually is at resting state residing in the cytoplasm of the cell, shown by the green channel on the top row, with the donut sized holes in the middle indicating the absence of these proteins in the nucleus at resting state or at no, no treatment. However, upon TNF alpha treatment, which is a cytokine that activates the NF kappa B pathway of P65, uh, actually, all of this protein translocates into the nucleus, as you can see by the green channel. And we also validated this by the P65 antibody stain uh, by immunofluorescence. And when we took suspensions of these nuclei or cells uh, and compared to the neon green signal by flow cytometry, we saw that uh, in non-treated cells, the nuclear fraction of the P65 protein shown by the solid line was much lower than the nuclear protein levels of P65 in the TNF alpha stimulated um, populations shown at the bottom by the red solid line. Uh, however, at the whole cell level, the total content of the P65 protein was unchanged at this time scale, which was really um, illustrated beautifully by Catherine Lilly's talk this morning, as well as some of Emma Lundberg's works as well. So this further emphasized the importance of looking at subcellular localization of proteins, and particularly from a gene regulation perspective, why it's important to measure nuclear protein levels rather than the protein levels in the entire cell. Uh -huh. It skipped us. Okay, yes, so our, um, to be able to measure this with antibodies, we took HeLa cells and had non-stimulated versus TNF-alpha stimulated populations, and we extracted nuclei and cross-linked them with formaldehyde and, um, so that they're permeabilized for the antibodies to uh, go into the nucleus. 
So on the um, fact spot here, I'm showing you on the y-axis, the uh, P65 antibody derived fluorescence level using a normal non-DNA conjugated version of the antibody. And on the x-axis is our quote unquote ground truth, which is the uh, neon green internal uh, genetic reporter. And when you mix two, the, uh, an equal mixture of the population of non-stimulated versus TNF-alpha stimulated, you would want to see that the ground truth and our antibody-derived signals correlate quite well. And that's what we indeed observed, and this was expected. So it was a nice sanity control. But when we first did the exact same staining conditions on the DNA conjugated format, format of the P65 antibody, there was no discernible signal um, difference between the non-stimulated versus the TNF alpha stimulated nuclei populations. So just to um, summarize again, the left is using antibodies that are normal clones without a DNA tag. And on the right is the uh, poor signal res uh, res resolution for the DNA conjugated format of the antibody. This is actually a fairly well-known problem, which occurs even in situ. So here is a um, work from Peng Yin and George Church's group, where they show that even for uh, cells residing just a normal cell line, when you're staining for um, a cytoplasmic protein, tubulin, with the fluorophore conjugated antibody, you see the nice donut hole showing the absence of antibody signal in the nucleus, but in the DNA conjugated format of the same antibody, you actually have a lot of high uh, nonspecific background. And I think this is really because the, uh, there are a lot of proteins and targets and substrates in the nucleus whose job it is is to kind of bind to nonspecific short oligonucleotides. Um, so this is a real challenge for getting good signal to noise ratios. So uh, we looked to reagents. Um, as this is a similar and solved problem for RNA fish and other uh, technologies that require probe search by a short sequence of oligonucleotide. And one key component we found was critical was dextrin sulfate. And when we added dextrin sulfate in our blocking buffer, as well as our antibody staining buffer, you actually now can see a clear resolution between the non-treated versus the TNF alpha treated nuclear populations. But when we actually, just to drive this point home, when we compared it to two different intracellular buffers that are commercially available by two different vendors, they don't resolve the signal as well. So this nuclear background signal is um, a key issue. And there's a different and a very clever solution that came out a few weeks ago in another preprint to also reduce this nonspecific um, signal from DNA conjugated antibodies in the nucleus. So with the optimized um, DNA conjugated uh, staining protocol, we then took the um, two different populations and measured the P65 protein levels using these DNA conjugated antibodies and loaded them onto the 10X platform. And we also included a hashing antibody, which allows us to multiplex and load these two treated populations onto the same 10X channel to eliminate batch effects between sample treatment. And uh, within the droplets, we basically see, uh, as illustrated before, the poly A tail on the DNA tags, as well as the RNA are captured simultaneously by beads in the droplets. So one thing we noticed right away is actually this, um, size dependence that uh, came up in a discussion earlier today. So on the x-axis, I'm showing you the number of tags captured by the nuclear hashtag counts, which are binding to the nuclear envelope. And that is kind of a proxy for nuclear size. And on the y-axis are the um, protein counts of our transcription factor of interest. And juxtapose on top and color are shown the RNA uh, UMI counts, which is a measure for RNA complexity or how many unique RNA molecules did you measure. And you can see that all three of these are actually correlated. And this has to do with the um, technical variations in the uh, capture efficiency of the poly A tail within each droplet emulsion in 10X. So in order to account for this, um, we normalize the protein abundance by the uh, nuclear hashtag counts. So we're concurrently um, controlling for nuclei size, as well as the technical artifact and biases in the poly A capture efficiencies across droplets. And then to um, transform the data into a normal distribution, we calculate the uh, center log ratios. I'm happy to discuss this further offline as well. So using this metric, we first compare the uh, sequence derived uh, P65 levels in the nucleus across our two different treated populations in the HeLa cells. And so as expected, we saw a nice separation of the uh, non-treated nuclei versus TNF alpha treated, uh, treated populations where the uh, P65 levels are elevated uh, after TNF alpha treatment. 
So using this um, sanity check, we then wanted to model what are the other genes genome-wide whose transcriptions, uh, uh, transcription expression patterns are influenced by the protein levels. So we conducted a simple linear model where each gene expression was modeled as simply the linear combination of the quantitative P65 protein level, as well as other factors controlling such as cell cycle and technical factors such as um, the RNA UMI counts and the nuclear hashtag counts. So here I'm showing you a represent, uh, representative sample of the top genes that came in our uh, came as hits in our linear model. So these are the top seven genes that are significantly associated with elevated p65 protein levels. Um, the top gray bars show you the relative p65 protein expression, and the bottom heat map shows you the uh, relative expression of the RNA. And all seven of these genes are actually known targets of the NF cat. NF kappa B pathway, of which the P65 protein is um, part of the complex. So this was a nice validation that at this time scale, after uh, TNF alpha induction, the elevated uh, nuclear protein level of this transcription factor is nicely associated with known target genes across the genome. So after this proof of principle, then we wanted to apply this. Well, I guess before that, I wanted to I added a quick slide um, since this audience is very interested in the. Uh, the relative information that you can get, gain from RNA and protein. So here I'm showing you a scatter plot showing the uh, relationship between the protein and the RNA. And this is to show that they're actually poorly correlated. Um, and we know from other works, actually two papers conducted from our lab several years ago um, in bulk assays, that the uh, rel -A transcript, which encodes for the P65 protein, is rapidly degraded while the protein P65 is quite stable across time. The difference in degradation rates um, is actually almost 100-fold, and you can grab the parameters from these papers, which we did. And this actually was um, nice to see that although the protein and RNA uh, levels are poorly correlated, they're actually consistent with what you would expect based on the kinetics of the regulation in the cell. Um, and I'll skip this for um, time purposes, but uh, in addition, the induction of rel -A at this time scale is not highly elevated um, by TNF alpha, further underscoring why it's really important to measure the protein levels in this regulatory and dynamic context. So after our proof of principle in the uh, cell lines, we wanted to move to an in vivo model. Uh, we chose a mouse brain um, practically because it's a very interesting system where you can easily induce cellular activity by inducing neuronal firing and neuronal activity. And we chose to stimulate the mouse brain by um, uh, using a seizure model where kyanic acid injection stimulates a seizure-like behavior in the mouse hippocampus, leading to hyper-excitable neurons um, and widespread neuronal activity. So similar to before, we took mice that are control-stimulated versus stimulated with kinetic acids to induce seizure, extracted the nuclei from the hippocampi, and this time we used um, four different proteins multiplex at the same time. So these four proteins target several different pathways. CFOS is a known transcription factor, which is activity regulated as well as P65. And then we included two other cell type specific protein markers as well. NUN, which is an RNA binding protein and an RNA splicing regulator uh, and a known neuronal marker. Uh, and PU.1, which is a transcription factor for the microglial lineage. So this time we multiplex these four different proteins and of course added the hashtag oligos for nuclear multiplexing and loaded them onto the 10x platform. So here I'm showing you an unsupervised clustering uh, showing in the UMAP projection space of the only the RNA or transcriptomic profiles from our insight seek data. So in the colors, so um, the way that these projections are created is to take highly variable gene expression patterns and use them to construct a um, unsupervised clustering map. And each of these clusters and colors are highlighted by broad cell types that are known in the hippocampus. And one thing that I wanted to quickly highlight, um, maybe this audience, um, for those of you who may have seen other UMAPs of the mouse hippocampus, these clusters are not as well resolved or separated as you're, uh, you would expect from really high quality single cell data of the mouse hippocampus. And that's because our formaldehyde treatment for fixation does degrade the RNA quality about sixfold. So uh, this is, uh, you can't uh, have free lunch. Uh, you do lose some reduction in RNA complexity, but we're able to circumvent this and still integrate our data 
Uh, so here now I'm showing you at the bottom that you can actually make these clusters resolve much nicer when you conduct joint integration or joint embedding with normal quality single nucleus RNA-seq data of the same organ, where you co-embed uh, co the RNA profiles that you get from our insight seq versus normal RNA-seq data. Um, and to illustrate that here, I'm showing you on the left the nicer resolved clusters of the mouse hippocampus cell types, showing you a lot more um, finer uh, cell types. And on the right, I'm showing you the same UMAP projection, but now each individual dot, which corresponds to an individual nucleus, is colored by the data modality type. So using a uh, deep learning iterative method called Harmony, you can actually have really nice data integration of these two different modalities, where the insight seek derived RNA profiles and the normal single nucleus RNA seq derived profiles overlap almost perfectly. And um, to drive this point home, actually for the single nucleus RNA seq data, we didn't even generate the data ourselves. We used data generated from a different group in a different published study cited below, showing how robustly you can preserve the underlying manifold of the RNA information across different data modalities. So once, and this is uh, another way to just represent and show you that's the uh, cell type clustering uh, based on known marker type, cell type marker gene expression is nicely resolved. So now using these RNA derived clusters on, on the UMAP space, we did a sanity check to see how the protein expression is derived. So instead of jointly embedding the RNA and protein information, which of course is very interesting and you can do, uh, we, did it, we wanted to first see how well our RNA information and protein information correlate with each other. So all of these clusters are generated from the RNA data alone. And now on top, we overlay the protein expression that we measured uh, and captured from InsightSeq. So in the blue cluster I'm showing you is a pan neuronal cluster. I've just labeled them as all blue. There are a lot of different subtypes of excit excitatory neurons there. And and now in the middle, in the um, blue, red uh, color map, I'm showing you the, uh, new, the um, protein counts of new N, uh, which is a well-known marker protein for neuronal nuclei. And so you can see a nice overlap in the expected areas of the neurons where you have elevated new N. And on the right in the histogram is another way to visualize the difference in the new N um, abundance in neurons versus non-neurons. And in the bottom, I'm showing the same kind of profile for P65, which is a known marker protein for endotheliums, endothelium or endothelial cells, uh, where in the um, bottom right corner, you can see the, or bottom left corner, you can see the endothelial cluster shown in the uh, purple, uh, also with elevated P65 levels and as well by the histogram on the right. And the microglia cluster is really tiny, so I didn't uh, highlight on the UMAP, it's very difficult to see. But um, you can also see by the histogram the enrichment of PU1 in the microglial cluster. And we further verify this by immunohistochemistry, where you can actually see elevated um, CD31 protein levels, which is a known marker for endothelial cells, co-localized with elevated levels of P65. Um, and one thing was interesting was actually P65 uh, was also expressed at a lower level in neurons by their co-localization patterns by mu N. Um, but the P65 levels um, here, yeah, I'm also showing you here in the um, Dende gyrus of the hippocampus showing lower but widespread expression levels of P65. Um, so what about the fourth protein? The fourth protein we uh, profiled was CFOS, which is a well-known activity marker used as a handle for neural uh, activity. So many neurons, once they fire, they're kind of... Um, as a heuristic are known to express CFOS and have elevated levels of CFOS in the nucleus. So when you separate the CFOS levels by the PBS treated, treated mice versus uh, kind of acid stimulated mice, you indeed see a significant increase in the CFOS protein expression levels. Um, and the CFOS protein is actually quite widespread in their expression patterns across all these different cell types. And we further validated this by immunofluorescence as well, where um, here I'm showing you the mouse hippocampus, the Dende gyrus, and the top shows you the uh, immunofluorescence in PBS injected mice, and the bottom shows you the P, uh, CFOS levels in the kinetic acid injected mice, showing really highly elevated levels after stimulation. And uh, conversely, P65, another activity regulated transcription factor, did not change in its expression levels in the neurons by kinetic acid stimulation at this time scale. So, uh, Using this data, we wanted to um, jointly model protein and RNA in a way that was informative of the regulatory context of the nucleus. So typically in the um, 
expectation from the central dogma, you would expect that if your uh, response variable uh, is modeled as um, a function of some predictor variable, uh, given the central dogma, you may try to model the protein expression as a function of the RNA transcript levels, uh, since the RNA transcript levels do still contribute quite a bit to the uh, level of proteins. But in the context of the nucleus, uh, I decided to actually flip the uh, modeling expectation. So in the context of transcription factors, we know from many other studies that the concentrations of the transcription factors in the nucleus is actually a mechanistic way for increasing the uh, search uh, kinetics for TF binding to their target genes. So here um, we model gene expression as, the, as a uh, function uh, of the regulatory protein levels. So to infer the global impact of these transcription factors on gene expression, uh, we implemented a two-step model. I'm happy to explain why I chose this two-step model uh, since we get this question all the time, but a simple answer is, is actually to account for statistical collinearity where you do not want to have two different um, variables that are highly uh, correlated to each other in the same linear model. Um, so first I regressed out the effect of the kinetic acid treatment and the cell type and then took the residuals of the first model and fit the residuals as a linear combination of the four different proteins that we measured. So this is a volcano plot showing you on the x-axis the effect size from the linear model um, associated with the PU.1 transcription factor, and the y-axis shows the significance. And some of these genes are indeed known uh, targets of PU.1 from chip seq studies. And in the middle, I'm showing you the genes associated with CFOS, and these are also known targets of CFOS. Uh, and on the right, I'm showing you the genes that are associated with P65. New one, we didn't probe too much, although we have the results since it's an RNA binding protein and a splicing regulator. So we didn't want to infer too much of a direct impact by that protein on the regulation of the gene expression. And you can also use our data to um, do this in a cell type specific way. So here I'm just showing you some examples of rank plots where we test various different genes uh, within individual cell types of the mouse of the campus and quantify the effect of each individual transcription factor on the genes in a cell type specific way. And although for our purposes, um, we're a little bit underpowered to do this uh, since we really want to show a proof of principle, in principle, you could do this if you have much larger data sets whether, where you're better powered. Um, and you can also do this among excitatory neurons. So to improve power, I uh, now did this um, modeling among the excitatory neurons, which is one of the most dominant cell types in this organ. Um, so next, we wanted to study how the uh, expression patterns of these genes associated with transcription factors are related to each other. So we calculated the Pearson correlation coefficient of how these genes correlate in their expression patterns across all the excitatory neurons. So the, here, this is a pairwise correlation map. Uh, X-axis and Y-axis shows the genes that are significantly associated with CFOS and P65 transcription factors. And the heat map values are showing you the Pearson correlation coefficients calculated across all of the neurons. And one thing we started to see was visually these distinct modules. And these modules, when we overlay the effect size of the protein, tended to coincide with distinct um, types of protein effects, uh, both positive or negative. So here in module one, they seem to be coincided with a negative P65 effect, meaning these co-expressed genes are down-regulated when you have elevated P65. Uh, whereas in other uh, uh, modules here, you can see that higher, uh, there's a cluster three, for example, which are genes that are elevated when CFOS protein levels are also elevated. And these kind of similar TF effects were also uh, corroborated by non-negative matrix factorization, which is commonly used in single cell analyses to find um, gene modules and gene programs. Aha, mm. uh -huh. okay. Uh, so, and then one thing that um, will be coming forth, uh, forthcoming in our paper is that there's also this possible interaction effect. So a lot of transcription factors are known to interact with each other. And so we probe this a little bit, although again, with a grain of salt that our data to do these kind of deep analysis is a little bit underpowered for these, but in principle, it is possible to use our data set, collect it at a larger population to look at not only the individual contributions of the transcription factors, but also how the interactions of transcription factors affect gene, gene expression.
Um, so I'll end by briefly going through, since um, for this audience, the relationship between the RNA and protein of the same coding genes is often of interest. So here I'm showing you, uh, it's a bit complicated, but it's a box plot showing you the on the y-axis, the um, uh, relative RNA expression patterns, and the x-axis showing you a binarized protein level. So either the protein binarized as low or high. Um, and we also have whether this uh, measurements for the single nucleus was conducted in a PBS injected mouse or a kinetic acid injected mice. So individual dots here correspond to individual nuclei uh, shown across the different uh, protein levels. And for CFOS and FOS, actually there's pretty good positive correlation where elevated um, CFOS proteins are associated with elevated FOS RNA. But when you look at the kinetic acid treated condition, there is no difference um, between PBS and kinetic, when you have CFOS high, uh, sorry, because when you already have high CFOS protein expression, um, sorry, the other way, I always also, um, sorry, when you look at the green boxes among the kinetic acid treated mice, whether you have low CFOS protein or whether you have CFOS high protein levels seem to have no bearing on the transcript abundance of FOS RNA. And we think that's because at this time scale, you've already saturated the expression level and the upregulation of the FOS RNA. Uh, so when you profile the mouse at this time point, the protein levels of CFOS may have already waned, but your RNA induction level is already sustained. And for rel -A, which encodes P65 in the mouse hippocampus, um, there seems to be no relationship between the RNA and protein levels. And for new N, we actually see the opposite effects where they're negatively correlated. And this is consistent with what we know in literature about how RNA splicing proteins are regulated. So if you have too much production of the RNA binding proteins, it may be toxic when you're binding to too much RNA. So there is a no negative regulation feedback loop for the RNA binding proteins. And indeed, we do see this in our data as well. Um, and finally, the fourth protein um, encoded by a gene called SPI1, SPI1, was actually not detected. So it's actually really important to measure the protein levels of these transcription factors, since the transcripts are often known to be at an extremely low abundance and subject to rapid degradation. And uh, one last vignette is to end on uh, this RNA binding protein new N. So what I showed you in the previous plot was the steady state mRNA expression levels um, showing this negative uh, correlation. But when you actually look at the intron retained uh, pre-mRNA splice, uh, unspliced form of the RBFOX3 gene, which encodes for new N, you actually see that among the new N um, high subsets, among uh, uh, under kinetic acid stimulation, you have this brief period or burst of high intron content of this gene. And it, it is actually known that these uh, RNA binding proteins are regulated negatively through the um, intron uh, content. So there's this, uh, there's a lot of rich dynamic information that um, you know we can spend a lot more in analyzing, but there's certainly uh, the benefits of measuring the protein and RNA level in the same single nucleus allows us to do these type of measurements to look at the dynamics of how proteins and transcripts regulate each other. So in summary, we um, developed a method to measure nuclear protein levels quantitatively, as well as the transcriptome in vivo. And we can compare these RNA and protein dynamics to better understand gene regulation and perhaps quantify the effect or contribution of individual transcription factors to gene module expression. And in the future, we want to study this to have better cell type specific profiling of signaling pathways in tissues, in disease, and also in homeostasis, and profile how combinations of transcription factors uh, disentangle the higher order of transcription factor combinations and how they contribute to gene regulation, as well as use this to monitor druggable protein targets during disease pro uh, progression. And I'd like to really acknowledge and thank the um, co-authors and colleagues uh, who participate in this work. So first off, my advisors, Avira Gev and Fei Chen, and a really fantastic research associate in the lab named Emma McGee. Um, and at Whale Cornell, this was a collaboration with David Artis's group and a fantastic postdoc named Chris Parkhurst and David's group, and uh, as well as a collaboration with BioLegend who helped us conjugate all these antibodies as Peter alluded to earlier. So thank you very much. Thank you, Hadi. Uh, you can keep the microphone. Okay. We'll have some questions for you. Okay. So there is a question from the audience, uh, uh, from the virtual audience, from Christoph Vandera. 
Christoph is saying, sorry, you probably explained it, but how did you annotate the cells from the Harmony integrated figure? Uh, did you choose one of the modalities or did you use both? So that's a great question. So sorry, that was a little fast. So we used the single nucleus RNA-seq profiles normally captured as well as the RNA profiles from our data. And then we integrated only the RNA um, information across the two assays. And then we used known cell type marker expression to uh, annotate the clusters from the published studies using only the RNA. Thank you. Are there other questions from the audience here, the in-person audience? I have half a dozen, but let me start with at least uh, a couple and then we, I, I can ask the other ones. Uh, so when you identified genes that were associated with those transcription factors, essentially you showed the volcano plots of effect size association of the protein transcription factors to various transcripts, transcript dependencies. The ones that had the highest effect size and the highest confidence were known targets, mm -hmm. but it seemed that there are a number of additional transcripts that are not known targets, uh, but nonetheless were significantly associated. And I wonder if you thought about evaluating why that is the case, if you're further validating some of those, or what do you think? Do you think that uh, we can have reasonable confidence that yeah, so that's a great question. So, um, so I think um, uh, the targets we infer, we never want to be too confident in assigning them as direct regulatory targets, but more that they're, they could be indirect targets as well. So one thing we looked at was their cis regulatory motifs upstream of those genes. And for certain uh, genes associated with, for example, CFOS, many of them were highly enriched for the CFOS transcription factor motif. But for P65, we actually didn't see such an enrichment. So we think that's coming from how um, you have uh, indirect effects where P65 protein levels happen to be elevated in cells that express that gene highly. And then maybe due to some intermediate signaling pathways or something else about that cell state that results in that correlation happening. And one thing as a caveat is that we do only measure such a handful of small number of proteins. But if you have more proteomic wide levels of transcription factors, you may be able to better disentangle which are the actually more likely um, causal transcription factors for those and maybe discover some unknown link between P65 and like the more direct targets of the, sorry, the more direct TFs regulating those genes. Yeah, yeah. thank you. It makes sense. The, the big challenge of distinguishing direct from indirect yeah. remains. Absolutely. Uh, so one, one more question uh, on, on my part and I'll have many more after, but uh, uh, I, when I think of measuring the messenger RNAs and the proteins from isolated nuclei, I think of that in a slightly different way. I think of the RNAs perhaps being more representative for the pool of RNAs present in the cell, while the proteins perhaps being more reflective of active localization in the nucleus, even though in any particular case, we don't know. We, we don't necessarily have the data, but I wonder how, how you think of that and whether that can perhaps change the interpretation also of the association uh, that you showed on the box plots of on distributions of RNA abundances mm -hmm. conditioned on low or high transcription factor. Yeah, so this is an excellent question. And um, actually the nuclear RNA content is not reflective of the total cellular RNA content. Um, this has been a big debate in the single cell RNA field for sure. So single nucleus and single cell RNA profiles are useful for getting the same high level view, such as cell types. But if you look at individual genes, they actually are quite different in their residence time in the nucleus, which has to do with the, uh, um, the bursting rate of the transcription, which differs across genes, which ones are more prone to degradation in the nucleus, which ones are exported out of the nucleus, all these factors. So I think that looking at intron retained levels may be a better way to also help us identify more direct targets upon induction, which are the nascent transcripts that are changing with the protein levels. But yeah, this is a active area for sure, yeah. Thank you, Hadi. All right, thank you, Nikolai.